Hi everybody, welcome back. Miss Calabrese here. Um, so in this video, we are going to be talking about uh, the processes of DNA replication, transcription, and translation. Okay, so we'll start off by just kind of discussing the structure of the DNA molecule um, to start with. Uh, so your DNA is um, a large macromolecule, macromolecule, large polypeptide, um, that's made up of many repeating subunits. So subunits are called nucleotides, uh, and they come in DNA, they come in four different varieties. So in DNA, your nucleotides are either going to be adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. Um, and those are always going to be the four nucleotides in DNA. Um, the amount that you have of each one is going to be variable um, from, from person to person, from species to species. Uh, but the amount of adenine will always equal the amount of thymine, and the amount of guanine will always equal the amount of cytosine. Um, and that's because those, those nucleotides tend to pair up um, across the center of the molecule. Um, and so a scientist named Shargaff figured that out, so we refer to that as, as Shargaff's rule now. So let's look at the structure of those nucleotides. Uh, so each nucleotide has three major components to it. Um, so we've always got a five carbon sugar, so that's right here. Uh, in DNA, that five carbon sugar is uh, uh, deoxyribose. In RNA, that five carbon sugar is ribose. Um, we also have a phosphate group over here, so there's always a sugar and a phosphate group. Uh, and then over here is our nitrogen-containing base, or our nitrogenous base. Um, in this particular nucleotide, the nitrogenous base is cytosine, but it could easily be um, guanine or thymine or adenine, just depending on what we're looking at here. Okay, so as we discovered a little bit more about um, um, DNA, one of the main researchers in this field um, was Rosalind Franklin. And Rosalind Franklin, uh, her, her main uh, focus of her research was to figure out the actual structure of the DNA molecule. Because um, there was kind of a lot of time where we didn't understand uh, what the molecule of heredity was, and we didn't understand, once we did get that it was DNA, we didn't understand what the structure of that molecule was that allowed it to carry so much information. Because right? that's the basis of this idea here, is that this molecule carries genetic information from one generation to the next. Um, so Rosalind Franklin was one of the key researchers here that, that um, helped us visualize what the actual shape of the DNA molecule was. Um, so she, she helped prove that it was this double helix uh, structure. Right. Um, these scientists, Watson and Crick, um, these guys uh, get most of the credit for discovering the structure of DNA. Um, although they used a lot of Rosalind Franklin's work, they were the ones that, that earned the Nobel Prize for, for figuring out the double helix structure um, of the molecule. All right, so here's what that double helix looks like. So when I say double helix, I basically mean a ladder so that we've got like two of these um, parallel run or two of these parallel um, parts of the ladder and then we've got horizontal rungs between them. Uh, and then we take that whole ladder and we twist it around its center axis. So that's what the double helix looks like, right? Um, and if we look closer at this double helix, so I'm gonna kind of outline one of the nucleotides here. We can see that it's just composed of many, many nucleotides all stacked on top of one another. So five carbon sugar, phosphate group, nitrogenous base. And then sitting on top of that one, we've got another nucleotide and another one and another one. Uh, and then that same pattern repeats itself on the opposite side of the molecule where we've got sugar, phosphate group, nitrogenous base on the other side. Right, so they're just, and they're always paired off where G always pairs with C, guanine always pairs with cytosine, thymine always pairs with adenine. That's why we can always tell that if you have um, X number of thymines, you're also going to have X number of adenines. Um, and those uh, nitrogenous bases are bonded across the center of the molecule with hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are the ones responsible for holding this together. Okay. So every time your cells reproduce, uh, we have to, and that's, this is true of your cells or any living cell, uh, we have to copy the DNA before the cell can reproduce because each new baby cell, each new cell, the daughter cells that come from that original parent cell, 
um, have to have equal copies of DNA in each of those new daughter cells. So we have to copy the DNA first. Um, and so this, this process of copying the DNA and making an identical copy uh, is called replication. So replication is something that all cells need to be able to do. All right, so the first step of replication um, is that we have to separate that double helix. So we have to, to kind of go down the middle and, and cut those hydrogen bonds that are holding the nitrogenous base pairs together. So we have to separate the strands. Uh, and then once we separate the strands, we're gonna use each one of those two strands as a template, as like a base, to build a new half strand on top of it. Um, so we refer to this process as a semi-conservative replication because every new DNA molecule is gonna be made half from an old molecule and half from a new molecule. So you use the old molecule to build on the new molecule. All right, so three main steps to this process. The first step is the, the unwinding or the separating of those two strands. Uh, in order to separate the two strands, we need uh, an enzyme. Uh, that enzyme is gonna be called DNA helicase. So helicase is the enzyme responsible for separating the two strands. So it basically goes in and cuts the hydrogen bonds that are holding the strands together. All right, after we've cut those hydrogen bonds and we've, we've, we've unpaired the strands, then we need to add our new complementary base pairs, so our new nucleotides to each of the old halves of the molecule. Uh, and the enzyme responsible for that is DNA polymerase 3. DNA poly 3 is responsible for complementary base pairing, which is adding the correct nitrogenous base opposite the ones that are already there on the template strand. Uh, and then the last step is called joining. Uh, and joining uses an enzyme called DNA ligase. And ligase is just there to help make sure that the backbones of our molecule, the sugar phosphate backbones, are all stitched together tightly and we've got it one continuous molecule. All right, so again, it's, it's referred to as semi-conservative because each new DNA strand is half new and half old. We're building from the old molecule to know where to put each nucleotide on the new molecule. All right, so here's a, an image to help you visualize that. Um, so up here we can see our kind of parent molecule. So we can see it looks like a double helix. We've got the, uh, we've got the two parallel sides and then we've got these, these rungs of the ladder with the nitrogenous bases in the middle. So what's happening here is we're cutting these bonds. Uh, so DNA helicase is coming in here and he's cutting these uh, hydrogen bonds that are holding the two sides of the molecule together. After we cut them, then we wanna do complementary base pairing. So if we cut this bond and we see that there's a T on this side, then our DNA polymerase three, DNA poly three is gonna come in and add an A to the other side. There's an A on this side, so we're gonna add a T to the other side. If we see a G here, we add a C. If we see a T, we add an A. So remember that A always bonds with T and T always bonds with G, and then it's pretty easy to build a new molecule. So all you have to know is one side of the molecule and you automatically know what's gonna be on the other side, right? So, so we, we separate the molecule with DNA helicase, we add our new complementary base pairs with DNA polymerase three. Uh, and then once we've got those molecules kind of built up, then we use DNA ligase to make sure it's all stitched together as one continuous molecule. Okay, um, one thing to kind of complicate this process a little bit. Um, so here we, we are looking at the same process here. So here's your parent DNA strand. Um, we're separating it with DNA helicase. So that's what's represented by this oval here is the, the helicase enzyme that's separating those two strands, right? And then we've got a strand going this way and a strand going this way. Um, the two strands of the DNA are not 100% identical. Um, they, are, they, are, um, they are what we call anti-parallel and anti-parallel means that they're kind of facing in the opposite direction. So, um, if you look at uh, the sugars, the five carbon sugars in the molecule, and one of these strands, the, the points, the, the top of the pentagons of those five carbon sugars are gonna be pointing in one direction, and on the other strand, they're gonna be pointing in the other direction. Um, so we refer to this kind of uh, directionality as being uh, five prime to three prime, or three prime to five prime, depending on 
which sugar or which carbon in the sugar the phosphate groups are linked to. Um, so what, what ends up happening is um, of, of these two strands, the one that's going in the five prime to three prime direction um, is pretty easy um, for DNA polymerase to make a copy of. So he can just follow the unwinding pattern. So if helicase is moving from, uh, from five prime to three prime, so five prime, uh, to three prime, then DNA polymerase can just follow him. And it's really easy for DNA polymerase to work in this five prime to three prime direction. Um, so we refer to that one as the leading strand. Um, now that's the only direction that DNA polymerase can work in. So in this lagging strand over here, that's on the bottom of the, this illustration, the lagging strand is going three prime to five prime, um, which DNA polymerase cannot do. Um, he can only go five to three. So in this lagging strand, instead of being able to kind of start at one end and follow the unwinding of DNA uh, helicase, which is what we're doing in the leading strand, we actually have to start um, at a certain uh, point and then go backwards so that we're going in the five prime to three prime directions. Start here, go backwards in the five prime to three prime direction. So instead of being able to do this continuously, we end up having to start backwards and go in these chunks. Those chunks of DNA are called Okazaki fragments. So in the lagging strand, DNA polymerase has to start um, and then move backwards in little segments called Okazaki fragments. Um, and then this is where DNA ligase really gets to shine because after we have all of these Okazaki fragments, DNA ligase can come in uh, and stitch all those fragments back together uh, so that we've got one continuous strand in the, in the lagging side uh, that will match the continuous strand on the leading side. Okay, um, quick note on the structure of RNA. So we've talked about the structure of DNA being this double helix. Um, it's got deoxyribose as the sugar. It's got the phosphate group and the nitrogenous bases. RNA structure is very, very similar, but there are a few key differences. Uh, one key difference is that um, in ribonucleic acid and RNA, our sugar is ribose instead of deoxyribose. Um, we don't use the nitrogenous base thymine. So thymine only exists in DNA. In RNA, we substitute uracil for thymine. Um, RNA is usually single-stranded. Um, so, so instead of having that double helix structure, we just have a single helix in most RNA molecules. Um, and there are lots of types of RNA, uh, but we're gonna be focused on, on learning the three major types, which are messenger RNA, which is sometimes just called mRNA, transfer RNA or tRNA, and then ribosomal RNA, which is rRNA. All right, and here's what that structure looks like. Um, so here we can see a, a single nucleotide being kind of circled here. So we've got the five carbon sugar, which is ribose, we've got our phosphate group, and then we've got our nitrogenous base in this one. The nitrogenous base is cytosine, the next one it's adenine, and then the next one it's uracil. And it's just the order of those bases that are going to change depending on uh, what, what each particular gene looks like here. All right, so basic similarities and differences between DNA and RNA. So they're both nucleic acids, which means they're both made of nucleotide subunits. Um, they both have a sugar phosphate backbone, um, and they both have four different types of bases. Uh, now, as far as the differences go, DNA you will always only find in the nucleus of a cell um, for eukaryotic cells. So the, the DNA is never going to leave the nucleus because it needs to stay very well protected in there. The RNA, um, we find RNA in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm. So the RNA can leave the nucleus and carry a message out to the rest of the cell. Um, DNA is your genetic material. So DNA is, is a recipe for how to build um, every protein molecule in your body. Um, RNA is just a helper, right? He's not carrying that recipe code. He is not the actual genetic material, but he's, he's an assistant molecule to DNA. Uh, in DNA, the, the main sugar, the five carbon sugar is deoxyribose. In RNA, the sugar is ribose. And the bases are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. In DNA, 
in RNA, they're, they're adenine, uracil, cytosine, and guanine. Um, DNA is double-stranded, RNA is usually single-stranded, um, and, then, and then we'll talk about these next two terms uh, uh, as to what's going on next. So DNA gets transcribed, RNA gets translated. All right, so at those three different types of RNA that I mentioned, so the first one, messenger RNA or mRNA, um, this one is, it's exactly as described, so it is a messenger molecule. Um, what it does is it gets made in the nucleus as sort of like a copy of a single gene, right? So your, your DNA is, um, is organized into genes, and each gene is a recipe for a protein. Um, an RNA is simply, a messenger RNA is simply a copy of that particular gene, of that particular protein recipe, right? So RNA is, is this copy that gets made in the nucleus uh, and then leaves the nucleus to go find a ribosome. Right, transfer RNA, um, this is also produced in the nucleus. His main job, though, is not to carry a message, so he's not a messenger. What he does is transfers amino acids to the ribosomes. Right, so if, if this messenger RNA is carrying an actual message to the ribosomes um, on how to build a protein, we need to get the, the building blocks. Right? And so the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. We're going to bring those amino acids to the ribosomes uh, with the help of a transfer RNA. So transfer RNA brings the amino acids to the ribosome. Uh, and then the last type of RNA here, ribosomal RNA, um, he kind of is the ribosomes himself. Um, so, so your ribosomes are made of ribosomal RNA and protein. Right? So just protein and ribosomal RNA makes the ribosome itself. So ribosomal RNA is going to be kind of like our, or the ribosome itself will be sort of like our, our kitchen where we're going to be assembling this protein molecule. It serves as this uh, space to get this job done. All right, so name the four types of nucleotides in DNA and the four types of nucleotides in RNA. So remember that they're not quite exactly the same. So there's your answers. In DNA, it's A, T, G, C. Um, so adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. In RNA, it's adenine, uracil, guanine, and cytosine. So no thymine in RNA. All right, so now we're going to talk about this actual process of gene expression. Um, so gene expression is also sometimes called protein synthesis. So those are the same thing. The, the synthesis of a protein is the expression of a gene because every gene is just a recipe to build a protein. So if we express that gene, that means we're building the protein um, that it tells us to build, right? So your DNA is, is, you can think of as your blueprint or your cookbook or whatever, whatever kind of metaphor you want here. The DNA is, is where we have all the information for how to build all these proteins. Um, but that DNA, uh, remember, always stays in the nucleus. DNA is never going to leave the nucleus of the cell. Um, and remember that proteins need to be synthesized on ribosomes, um, and the ribosomes are not in the nucleus. So somehow we got to get the message from this DNA. We got to take this recipe, recipe and find a ribosome. All right, so there are a couple steps to that process. Um, and the first is that we have to do transcription, and transcription is um, the process of taking information from DNA uh, and turning it into a messenger RNA molecule. And so this is taking the DNA message and making it, um, um, uh, kind of converting it to a messenger RNA molecule. Right? Then that messenger RNA molecule can leave the nucleus and he can go find a ribosome. And when he finds a ribosome, he's going to uh, dictate how to uh, build the protein from this message, and that process is translation. So translation is making a protein from the mRNA message. All right, so we need both of these steps, and it always, always happens in this order. So DNA always gets converted to RNA, RNA always gets converted to protein. All right, so that's the flow of information in every living organism. And note here that we're, we're talking about DNA and RNA working together. Um, and that's incredibly important for life. Um, and that's why uh, one of the reasons why viruses aren't considered alive is that they don't have both of these. They only have one or the other.
Okay, so here's our um, overall kind of visualization of the flow of information here. So here's our DNA um, that we find in the nucleus of the cell. So we're up here in the nucleus. Um, uh, we're going to do this process of transcription, which is making a copy of just part of the DNA. So we don't copy the whole thing. Um, we just copy one recipe at a time or one gene at a time. So we take our, our DNA and we kind of unwind a portion of it, and that portion is going to be the template. Um, so we take the template DNA strand, and we use that template to build a messenger RNA. Um, and the process is going to be pretty simple. It's pretty, pretty um, similar to what we looked at with the process of replication, and that if we've got a C on this side of my template DNA strand, there's going to be G in the RNA. Um, if there's an A on this side of my DNA, then we're going to have a U in the mRNA, remembering that uh, RNA doesn't have T, so we have to replace it with U. If we've got a T in the DNA, then we can go ahead and put an A in the RNA. Right? So we're just, we're just using that same complementary base pairing rules to come up with this, this, this RNA transcript, and then that RNA transcript can leave the nucleus to go find a ribosome. All right, so here's our ribosome down here. So the RNA transcript leaves the nucleus. Uh, we can see it down here. So it's the same exact transcript that was up there in the nucleus, but now we're in the ribosome. Um, and now this is where our tRNA is going to come in handy. So that transfer RNA, remember, is responsible for bringing amino acids to the ribosome. Um, and he knows which amino acids to bring uh, because you have a code. Um, that tells him what amino acids are, are going to correspond to which letters in this genetic code. Right? So, for example, and we read these three letters at a time. So GGU, for example, is the first three letters here. Um, GGU and mRNA um, is going to match up with um, a three-letter sequence. So this is a codon. A codon is a three-letter sequence. So that three-letter codon sequence in the mRNA is going to match up with this three-letter codon anticodon uh, in the tRNA. Uh, and that anticodon is going to be associated with a particular amino acid. Uh, so in this case, uh, GGU in the mRNA um, gives us a CCA anticodon and our amino acid is glycine. Um, in this next one, AGA is the codon. That makes our anticodon in the tRNA UCU, and that tRNA is going to bring the amino acid arginine. And this last one, ACC, is the codon. UGG is the anticodon. Uh, and then threonine is our, uh, our amino acid. Right. And remember that amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So if we build up enough of those amino acids, uh, we get a polypeptide. Uh, and if that polypeptide is folded properly, so remember our primary, secondary, tertiary, and even sometimes quaternary organization of proteins, that's when we finally get an actual protein from this process. Okay, so, so, um, so this genetic code, um, you're going to need to know some of this code, but but not all of it for sure. Um, so uh, so a little bit of terminology differentiation here. A triplet is a sequence of three nucleotides in DNA. A codon is three nucleotides in mRNA. Uh, and remember, an anticodon is three nucleotides in tRNA. Right. So each codon, each three three letter word here. Um, codes for one single amino acid. And so this is how we start to build polypeptides. Right, so here's what, here's what this language looks like. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at these um, codons here, we can see that this is all just sequences of three-letter words. Every three-letter word then codes for one particular amino acid. So UUU uh, and UUC are both three-letter codons that code for the amino acid phenylalanine. Um, if we jump over to this next one, UCU, UCC, UCA, UCG, all of those are going to code for the amino acid serine. Right? So, so these are all just possible three-letter words that, uh, that act as kind of a code to give you a particular amino acid. Right? Notice there are a few here that, that, um, that are a little bit different. So we've got, we've got a couple here and one here that say stop. 
So those are our stop codons, UAA, UAG, UGA. Um, and when that sequence comes up in the mRNA, that tells the ribosome that it's time to stop. Right? We're no, the protein is over, the message is over, it's the end of the recipe. So those are our signaling codons that tell us the recipe is over. We also have one over here um, that's our start codon. So every uh, polypeptide that's created on, on a ribosome is going to start with AUG. So AUG always indicates a start codon, um, and that start amino acid is always methionine. And so methionine or AUG is always the one we start with. Now sometimes that methionine will get clipped off later on and doesn't end up as the final part of the protein, but it always, always starts there. Right? So these are our codons. Again, you don't need to memorize all of these. Uh, but you should be familiar with the fact that AUG is the codon to start, and that uh, codes for the amino acid methionine. Okay. All right, I'm going to step back to the transcription step just really quickly so we make sure that we understand what's going on here. All right, so here's our, um, here's our DNA, right, and this DNA is in the nucleus of the cell. Um, we're going to use an enzyme here to help us make an RNA, and a messenger RNA from that DNA template. And that messenger RNA is going to be created by this enzyme RNA polymerase. So polymerase RNA is the one that's going to help us read the DNA molecule uh, and then make an mRNA that's basically a copy of that part of the DNA molecule. So we use the template strand of the DNA. Um, for the RNA polymerase to read, and then he's just going to do follow base pairing rules. So he sees a C over here, he's going to add a G. If he sees a G over here, he's going to add a C to the mRNA. If he sees an A, he's going to add a U, because remember there's no T uh, in mRNA. Right? So eventually, um, this enzyme's kind of chugging along, he's going to create this, this mRNA transcript, so uh, a long sequence of nucleotide bases here that are in the correct order. Uh, to help create a protein. All right, so that once we have that mRNA transcript, um, we have to make some adjustments to it um, before it can be completely functional and sent to a ribosome for the translation process. Um, so the, the first thing we're going to do is called capping and tailing. So we're going to add a cap and a tail um, this molecule, and that's just going to help protect it. So it's a, it's basically a, a series of extra nucleotides that are tacked on to the beginning and the end of the transcript. That's going to help um, serve as sort of like bodyguards that are helping to to protect this uh, transcript as it gets sent out of the nucleus. Because once we leave the nucleus, it's like uh, it's a little bit of the wild west out there in the cytoplasm, and we don't want any damage to happen to the transcript. All right. Um, the other thing that we have to do is remove any parts of this transcript that, that were for non-coding DNA. So not all of your DNA actually serves as direct parts of the recipe um, that are going to be useful uh, when you're actually creating the recipe. So think about this as like when you go online and search recipes online and every blog has you know a million extra paragraphs in there that are not really pertinent to your understanding of the recipe, your DNA has that too. Um, and so those are, those are non-coding segments that you just have to kind of edit out, ignore, move past. Uh, we call them introns. So the introns need to be removed. So we have to basically edit those parts out. Uh, and that can be a lot. It can be up to 98% of, of the DNA here is introns or non-coding segments. Um, we used to think they did nothing. Later on, we found out that those are, those are regulatory sequences, some of them. Some of them are viral DNA that's just stuck in there, but, um, uh, but not all of the DNA is directly coding for proteins. All right, so we have to cut out the introns, uh, and that leaves us with the, the rest of the coding DNA, which we refer to as the exons. So exons get expressed as proteins. Introns are intervening segments. We cut those out. Right, so, so in this process of cutting out the introns and stitching the exons back together is called RNA splicing. Right? And this is going to be important to creating a complete RNA transcript. Right, so here's what that looks like. So up here we see our DNA. DNA is composed of both exons and introns, exon, intron. Um, and then when we do our transcription to make our mRNA, we still have 
exons, and introns, um, we have to cut those out, right? So we use special enzymes here to cut out the introns and stick the exons back together. So now we've got one continuous mRNA transcript that consists only of exons and the introns have been cut out. All right, so then that, that mRNA transcript now is free to leave the nucleus. It's going to find its way to a ribosome. Um, it's going to sort of squeeze in between the large and small subunit of that ribosome, uh, and it will then wait to be read um, to, to create this polypeptide. So this is where our tRNA is going to come in handy. So remember, the tRNA is the one that's bringing the amino acids. So he's got this important part of him called the anticodon. Uh, and the anticodon is just going to read the opposite of whatever the codon was uh, in the mRNA. So, so we've got a particular tRNA here. If the tRNA has this anticodon, for example, GCU, then he's always going to be carrying the amino acid arginine. Right? So, so think of these as always kind of going together. So uh, GCU on the anticodon always brings arginine. Right? So there's obviously going to be 64 different possible three-letter words you can have here because it's a it's a four-letter language that we're dividing into three-letter words, which gives us 64 possible combinations. Um, there are only 20 amino acids um, that build all proteins uh, in humans, so so we only uh, we only really need 20. But there's a lot of overlap. We call that redundancy in the code, meaning that sometimes your DNA can even make a mistake and you end up with the same amino acid, so that's kind of handy. Um, so, so this uh, process of translation is just bringing in the correct tRNA that has the correct anticodon. He's going to drop off the amino acid that was associated with that codon, uh, and then we sort of continue to slide through uh, the ribosome and bring our next tRNA. Right? So the, the first step of this process, when we're just beginning to build uh, the protein. So, so we've got um, our, our ribosome here that's got the large subunit and the small subunit. And we can see that the mRNA is just going to sort of slide in between the large and small subunit. Our start codon is always AUG, so that's going to tell us that it's time to start building this protein. So when we read AUG on the start codon, we need to find a tRNA that's got the matching anticodon. So in this case, if the start codon is AUG, the opposite anticodon is UAC. Uh, and, and the anticodon um, is always going to be associated with the amino acid methionine. Right? So whenever we see an AUG codon, we get a tRNA with a UAC who's carrying a methionine. Right? And then uh, that process where we, we start the the, uh, the protein by laying down that initial methionine, that's called initiation. Next step in the process is elongation. So elongation happens when this uh, mRNA transcript begins to slide through uh, uh, the, in between the large and small subunit of the ribosome, and we find the next little codon there. Uh, and that next little codon is going to be matched up with its own tRNA, who's going to, again, drop off an amino acid. Uh, and those amino acids are then going to be stuck together through peptide bonds. We eventually get this kind of longer and longer and longer chain of amino acids. Okay, so every step that we add a new amino acid onto this chain uh, is part of the elongation process. Uh, and then the final step of the process is what happens when we hit a stop codon. Uh, so one of those stop codons is going to tell us that uh, it's time to, to end, the recipe is over, and that's the termination step. So at that point, um, the, the polypeptide will be released uh, from the ribosome, the mRNA will go get recycled, uh, and that polypeptide can then move uh, to the Golgi apparatus to be uh, folded or, or whatever needs to happen with it next. All right, so we're going to go through this. I know that the process of transcription can be a little tricky, so we're going to go through it kind of one step at a time uh, with this kind of animation. So here's the overall process. Let's break it down uh, one step at a time here. All right, so in, in the nucleus, um, we've got transcription happening. So we can see our DNA molecule. We're unwinding just a part of that DNA molecule uh, to serve as a template. Um, so we're just doing one gene at a time, and that's where the enzyme M 
our um, the enzyme RNA polymerase is going to come in and help us make this RNA transcript, this mRNA transcript. Right, so then once we've made the mRNA transcript, we have to do the splicing. Uh, so the splicing is using enzymes to cut out the introns and sticking the exons back together. Once we've done that, then we've got our mature uh, mRNA transcript, and that mRNA transcript is going to leave the nucleus through one of the nuclear pores. Right, so he goes out of a nuclear pore and he finds his way to a ribosome. We can see that mRNA kind of going in between the large and small subunits of a ribosome. As he's going through the large and small subunits, uh, uh, tRNAs are going to be reading uh, the mRNA three letters at a time, one codon at a time, and bringing with them the associated amino acid. Right, so we can see here the codon is being matched with an anticodon on the tRNA. The tRNA is dropping off the amino acid that's associated with that codon. Uh, and then that particular tRNA will float away and go find another amino acid somewhere in the cytoplasm. Um, and this whole process will just um, continue to move through uh, the ribosome. All right, so as we're doing this, uh, we're making these long polypeptide strands. Those polypeptide strands are being created in the lumen of the rough ER. So remember, that's where our, most of our ribosomes are embedded in the membrane of the rough ER. So we're creating these polypeptides in the lumen. All right, and then um, next step is when we hit that final stop codon, uh, then that's going to uh, start the termination process. And termination means that the the large and small subunits of the ribosome will separate, the mRNA will go get recycled, uh, and now we've got our completed polypeptide.